Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to actually read the section of Scripture, verses 17 through 20. Trust you'd follow along with me as we read uh, the written word of God together. These are the words of God, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 20, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints are, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Well now, as for God, his way is perfect and the word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield for all who trust him. Amen. The title for the message today is The Blessing of Spiritual Power in Christ. The Blessing of Spiritual Power in Christ. Isn't it wonderful to know that God wasn't just gracious to us in saving us, he's given us the power to live the Christian life. I mean, seriously, where would we be without the power of God? As we've heard today already, we are weak. <laughs> we offer nothing to uh, the uh, ability to serve the will of God. We need the power of God in our lives. Now, we'll look at two points today. I think it'll, do, it'll take me all my time uh, to do these two. Firstly, verse 19, the power of God in us. And secondly, the power of God in Christ power of God in us and the power of God in Christ. The main point being that Paul wants his readers to know that just like their saviour, the power of God is at work within them also to overcome all that we face in this life. God's not just given us promises, a plan of salvation. He's not just predestined us. He has given us the power to live the Christian life and praise God for that. Now, by way of uh, really sort of laying out uh, the, the, the doormat to where we're going today for the front door of the house, we need to, again, just quickly look at our context. Uh, we find ourselves in the midst of Paul's prayer, don't we? He's started praying uh, in verse 15 for this cause. He rejoices in the, uh, verse 15, the faith of the Christians in Ephesus and their love toward each other in the church. And he begins to pray. And verse 18 is the linchpin. Have a look at it with me in your Bibles. Chapter 1, verse 18. Here is the linchpin, the earnest of his prayer, that the eyes of their heart might be enlightened, that they may know, so there it is, that they may know. Now there is a likelihood that he's praying this because they don't fully know yet what they need to know. As we know, learning is a process. Spiritual learning in particular is a process because we need the help of the Holy Spirit to reveal these truths. Now, he uses the word in the Greek, eido, E-I-D-O, eido. And for us in the English language, I'll explain using, again, another form of anecdote. You know when you have that moment where the lights come on? You had that aha moment. I get it. Duh. <laughs> now I understand. That's what no means in Ido in the Greek, uh, to, to put it as best as we would understand it in a Western context. So Paul wants the lights to come on. He wants them to have that aha moment where they realise what they have in front of them. And he points out three things that he wants them to know in verse 18. He wants them to know what is the number one, the hope of of their calling. I've got them up on the screen. Secondly, he wants them to know what are the riches of his inheritance. And he wants them to know, which is the one we're going to look at today, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And it's almost like Paul leaves this last one on the end to really help us to see that all these other things need the power of God as their backing and support. And he uses multiple words to say that. Now, this 
should remind us that as Christians, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Amen? But we have responsibilities. We must go on to know the hope of our calling. Christ has called you, dear Christian, and he's called you to live a profitable, godly, Christ-honoring life. He's called you to that. You have a higher, noble calling. You have a race to run. You have a fight to fight, and you must do a good job of it. And God's even given you his power to do that. He's given you an inheritance of everything that is there for you and will be there for you in the future. And he's graciously given that to you. He's saved you. He's called you. You've heard, uh, as we saw in verse 13, in whom you promised, uh, or you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you heard, you believed the gospel, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So these things all happen when you became a Christian. God gave you his Holy Spirit. And this links to this third promise today where we're given the exceeding greatness of his power. So blessings and responsibilities. Yes, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing, but we have responsibilities. And so we're going to look at those today, uh, particularly the third one, the responsibility of stewarding the power of God in our lives. We've been given a wonderful gift. Earthen vessels, but contained within the earthen vessel is a wonderful treasure. The exceeding greatness of his power. Now, verse 18, or should I say verse 19 and 20, tease out some wonderful doctrines for us. The resurrection of Christ is shown. The same power that resurrected Christ from the dead is in you. Wow! Did you get that? Paul wants you to know that the same power that raised Christ is in you. We've got the whole New Age world running around out there saying, well, there's a power in you. If you look deep enough, you'll find something within you to give you all the answers. Obviously, that's a complete lie. But as Christians, we are given the Holy Spirit to live a whole totally different life. There is uh, a wonderful treasure within us, this earthen vessel that we are to discover, to know, I do, to have that aha moment of what lies within us and to uh, take advantage of that power and ability that God gives us. And so, really, uh, we've not just got the doctrine of the resurrection, we've got the doctrine of pneumatology, the power of the Spirit, we've got the doctrine of the union of Christ. We'll see towards the end of the chapter that Christ is the head and everything is under his feet and we're in his body right? Head, feet, body, that's head and feet are a part of a body, and he fills that body, all in all. Well, what does he fill it with? He fills it with gifts, spiritual gifts, men, graces, uh, all of the different gifts that are described in the Bible, the common gifts of grace, uh, of course, right through to all sorts of gifts, ministry gifts and spiritual gifts and grace-based gifts, including the grace of the character of Christ to live out a Christian life. So we've got wonderful doctrines here to look at as we go. So let's get into our first point, which is the power of God in us, verse 19. I'll again just read verse 19, which states, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Now, there's a lot in this line, and there's a lot of descriptive words in this line because Paul has an agenda, I believe, to help us to see uh, what's going on. Firstly, if you're taking notes, Paul assumes something. He assumes that the Christian needs power to do the job. Some of you that, uh, you know, you're laborers, you, you get to the job site, uh, one of the first things you look for is, where's the power? <laughs> Can't do much without the power. Uh, well, that's us as Christians. I can't do anything without the power. So do we have lights? Do we have uh, PowerPoints? Do we, we need power to do the job. And it's the same in the Christian life. So Paul's assuming that to live a God-honoring Christian life, to achieve the calling, to attain the inheritance, you need power. These three go together. The highness and the noble calling we have to live that out, to honour God in your inheritance and taking all that which is yours in Christ, so to speak, and then getting to the point where you are um, finally with Christ in that final inheritance stage, and that takes power. 
So Paul here talks about three things. That is what we need, which is power beyond our own ability. It's his power, as you can see there. Where does it come from? From God. And thirdly, who is it for? It's for Christians. It's for those who believe, toward us who believe, the text says there in verse 19. So Paul is obviously talking about this power that works within us. So he's talking about real Christians who have the power of God in them, but they might not know that God's given them all they need for that task. Notice in verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Not what could be or might be. It is there right now. This is a very important thing because sometimes we can get caught up, oh God, I need more power, I need more, uh, more strength, I need more. And look, you may, but the truth is that you have all of Christ within you now through his spirit. You just need to actually draw on the truths and the means of that to, to draw that out because God has given you all the power you need for the Christian life, amen? It's not a matter of jumping through hoops to get more power from God because you're not... You know, God has given you what is the exceeding greatness of his power that is in you now. It's toward you now. So let's be clear. God is not some, well, I'll give you a bit more if you ask a bit harder. No, God has given you everything you need. Or else Paul's wrong. You don't have all you need. No, Paul says you have every spiritual blessing, including power. There it is. This power that has worked within us. Now, verse 13, if we go back there. As we've said, you were already sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, you may miss that at first glance, but the Holy Spirit, do you see it? Of promise. Well, what's the promise? It's the Holy Spirit of promise. So, the Holy Spirit was promised. Let's go back to Luke, and we'll have a look at some Bible verses together. Book of Luke, chapter 24. Paul's referencing it as the Holy Spirit that was promised. So in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. And behold, Jesus says, I send the promise of my Father upon you. So tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power. That word there is dunamis. It's the same word that Paul is using in Ephesians 1. So Christ promised the Spirit, to the disciples. Notice everyone, 120, all of them were filled. All of them were filled. This is a pattern that would be replicated throughout the book of Acts and continues on through church history. They're filled and they're endued with power from where? On high, where Christ promised that it would be sent from the promise of the Father that he sent. Now, go forward to when this was fulfilled in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but what? Wait for the promise of the Father, which he says that you have heard of me. I promised you something. Now, some of you have had somebody promise you something haven't you? And you've had to go back and say, you promised. You promised me. I mean, maybe you might not have done it with a, maybe a good attitude, but that's the premise. Christ promised something, and if what he says is always true, he will fulfill it. So if he promises that he will give his Holy Spirit to believers, then we better believe it. And Paul's writing to the Ephesians saying, you better believe you've got the spirit of promise. You better believe it because Christ promised it. And I'm telling you, under the inspiration of Scripture, that you have all the power you need. And in verse 19, he goes and says, you've actually got the same power that Christ has. Now, I'll make a distinction there in a moment, but let's just stay with me in the book of Acts. Now, I didn't plan to go there, but let's go over to one more page in your Bibles, I'll assume, to Acts chapter 2. And Peter is preaching under the power of the Spirit. In verse 32, he says, This Jesus has God raised up where we are all witnesses, therefore being at the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father. All right, so Christ is exalted, and we have received of the Father the what? 
the promise of the Holy Ghost that he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. So this is the promise fulfilled in Acts. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He has all authority. Doctrine of ascension, exaltation, and uh, intercession or session, if you like. And he's now poured out his spirit, the spirit of promise upon the church. Now go down to verse 39, where Peter says, this promise, we know what the promise is, the promise of the spirit to all believers, is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now does that include every Christian? Absolutely. So every Christian that the Lord calls, calling, that you know the hope of your calling, everyone that the Lord calls is given the Spirit. And we know that because you can't call Jesus Lord without what? The Holy Spirit. So we've got to get this right. Paul's saying, you Christians in Ephesus, You've got the Holy Spirit. Now, he's not saying it, I believe, because they don't think they've got it. He's saying it for another reason, which we'll look at in a minute. But he's reminding them this promise of power, this promise of the Spirit, this spirit of promise is in you. And you need to remember this given the context that you live within. So we're taking time to establish that because it's sort of a very important conversation in the context. Now, let's go back to Ephesians where we begin to see how Paul describes this power. Now, he uses, really, he's piling up Greek words here. He uses six words to describe the power. Six words. Two are um, sort of the extent of the power uh, and four other types of power. He uses... Uh, and I've got them listed up there on the screen. If you're watching the sermon online, you can go to the notes and there's a PowerPoint link you can click on and see these. Hyperballon, uh, w which basically means uh, to excel or to exceed, in the exceeding. All right, that's the word exceeding there. Greatness is megathos. We know when we call something mega, we say that it's great. That's an 80s word, but we used to say that word a lot. But it means the extent, the greatness. Of the power. So the exceeding greatness of his power, dunamis, there, that's the same word for the spirit of promise. The 120 disciples in the upper room received the dunamis power. All right, so it's, that, that is a word that relates to exertion or the ability to get the job done. So when we say dunamis power, we mean the power to get the job done. Then we've got the word energia, which obviously comes from the word that works within you. You've got the energy to work that out or work that through to perform that ability. And then we've got two other words which generally relate to God in Iskus and Kratos. Both of those are his mighty power. So there's another word for power. Here's the weakness of the English language. Both dunamis and kratos are in English in your Bibles, the word power, but they're different Greek words. So we need to know that it's his power, kratos, that gives us our power to perform an ability Dunamis. Quick Greek lesson, sorry if I've bored you, but Paul is piling up these words, but he's not doing it by accident. Why does he use six words to describe God's great power within us and, and basically tease it out so that he's not using hyperbolic terms or exaggerations, but he's certainly trying to extenuate uh, and exhaust the Greek language to describe the power of God in the Christian. Well, many commentators believe, and a guy that's done a lot of work on this, is a guy called Clinton Arnold. Now, Clinton Arnold has gone back and looked at Ephesus. He's looked uh, at some of the ancient inscriptions and the papyri that were discovered in Ephesus over time. And his claim is this. And in context, I think he's got a pretty fair claim. He says... Some in Ephesus were converted out of a background of magic, the Artemis cult, that's the Diana, great as the Diana of, of Ephesus, the Artemis cult, or astrological beliefs. Now, Paul writes to a group of churches in Western Asia Minor which needed help in developing a Christian perspective on the powers and encouragement in their ongoing struggles with these pernicious spirit forces. Uh, his claim 
is the particularly rare terms that Paul is using are found in the magical papyri and inscriptions from ancient Ephesus. So you go back and do the archaeology work, go back and do the historical work, and you'll find that the same words that Paul is using in Ephesians 1 and throughout the book of Ephesians are found in really the religious works of Ephesus. So what we believe Paul's prayer is basically working on is telling the Christians in Ephesus that all of these other great powers, I mean, it was a great temple of Artemis. It was one of the ancient wonders of the world. You would be fooled into believing that when you saw the greatness of that temple, that you would think there's some great powers behind that temple. I don't want to muck around with that. And Paul himself knew that the people who worshipped Diana, uh, the goddess uh, of Ephesus, uh, Paul was taken to task by some of those men who had political power uh, and really um, just took took to him. And so this idea that Paul is writing uh, to display Christ's power over the evil powers, right? Uh, Christ is greater than all of these other powers. There is no longer... Christians at Ephesus, as they read the letter, there's no longer any reason for them to fear the tyrannical religious or political powers of Rome that are still present around them in the city of Ephesus. Inside them is the greatest power of all, the power of God. So that's Paul's oomph here. Paul's saying, you guys have a lot of bad stuff happening in Ephesus, but inside you is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You don't need to worry. So really, he's helping them to be courageous, helping them not to be fearful. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot at stake here for the, for the Ephesian churches. And look, even now, uh, we live in a pagan world. It's easy to be afraid, right? It's easy to be anxious. It's easy to be alarmist. But we don't want to be that. We want to be (laughs) faith-filled. We want to be able to trust the Lord Jesus. He has all rule. He has all authority. I'm looking to him. I'm not looking, yes, there's a lot of bad stuff happening, but my trust is in God. And so that's the the clear thinking that I think Paul wants the Christians to have. I know I'm laboring this a little bit, but I think if we can put ourselves in the Ephesians boots, we can think, you know what? Uh, God's been very gracious to me. He's given me all the power I need to stay faithful, to not lose my way, and I can look to him. Now, I'm also going to help you to see why I think Paul is writing this way, apart from Clinton Arnold's quote. Contextually, this also makes sense in your Bibles. So I need you to have a look at your Bibles now and go down to verse 31, where Paul uses four parallel phrases to describe the demonic powers. So he gives us four things for us. The exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, that's in us. So he gives us four, and I've got them up on the screen, so you know what they are. The dunamis, the energia, that's us. So we've got dunamis and energia to get the job done by God's exceeding power, iskus kratos. So that's what he says to us in verse 19. But then he says it because of the demonic powers that obviously rule, there's always demonic powers behind false religion, always demonic powers behind evil political systems and structures like pagan Rome. Paul clearly teaches that in other places of the Bible, including Corinthians and Romans. And so he, I believe, lines this up to verse 21, which as we can see in our Bibles, principalities, powers, mights and dominions. So what's Paul doing here? He's using parallelism. He's saying, look at all these evil powers, but firstly, he reminds them, look at all the power that God's given you. Now, that doesn't mean you in yourself are powerful. It means that God in you is greater than those things in the world. Amen? Greater is he that is in you than all of the demonic powers that are in the world and all that the demonic powers influence. So the church, and this is where we've got to come back to a doctrine of ecclesiology of the church, The church always has to stand secure in the fact that God in our midst is our greatest prize of all. We don't want to be threatened or assuaged by any other power 
any other principality, any other might or dominion. Christ's rule is primary and it's most jealously guarded in the church, which is his body, whom he fills. We don't need another power to tell us what to do. Christ has given us his power in us, including the Spirit of God, which reveals truth to us. We know how to live. We know how to govern ourselves. And we honour the government, but we honour the government in a way that they obviously are there to do good and to punish evil. And for that, we give praise to God when they do that. But when corruption sets in, we obviously need to remember, like the Ephesians, when pagan Rome was corrupted and Caesar started calling themselves gods, uh, that, that we need to be very, very careful. So Paul wants the Christians in Ephesus to be encouraged. <laughs> I hope you're encouraged today that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can indeed humble yourself, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee. These are good promises from God who's given us his good Holy Spirit wonderful now if it's not enough this same word power appears throughout the book of of ephesians and i just want to show you one place where it appears so turn forward to chapter 3 and we'll look at verses 18 through 20 by now paul's hoping that they know that the power of god is in them and he says in verse 18 that you may be able to comprehend another word for no With all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So keep being filled with all that God has for you, and to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power, that's dunamis power, that works in us, not might be working in us, not could be, No, that works in us, present tense. Praise God. And he's reminding them, nothing can separate you from the love of God and the power of God is in you to affect all you need to do for Christ's sake. This is good news. In actual fact, to say that we don't have the Spirit as a Christian is to say we don't have Christ because he is the Spirit of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's the only thing that makes us holy is that we have the Holy Spirit. That's why, uh, as R.C. Sproul says, the appellation of holy is given to the Spirit because his job is to make us holy. I mean, Christ is holy. He's the Holy One. He's the Holy Son of God. The Father is holy, but they're all holy. That's why the angels sing, don't they? Holy, holy, holy is the triune Lord God Almighty. Let's go to point two. The power of God in Christ. Okay, the power of God's in us, but Paul now uses an example. The supreme example, really. Can't get better than Jesus, can you? He uses the supreme example of what God the Father can do in human flesh when it comes to the dunamis work of the Spirit. And he gives Jesus as the archetypal example. Christ the man... Same as our flesh. He's flesh and blood, like you and I. Christ the man. Yes, I know he's man and God. But Christ the man whom God raised, that man from the dead, and in his raised humanity, in his glorified humanity, he gave that God man ultimate authority as head of the body to fill all in all, which includes his church. And God used, have a look at it in verse 20, which he worked, that is the power, the exceeding greatness of his power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him. When? That's the incident. When he raised him from the dead and set him down at the right hand in heavenly places. Raised from the dead. Not even the power and the grip of death could hold the power, uh, hold back the power of God. That's the same power in you. Power to overcome death. That's pretty strong power, friends. Power to raise you from the dead. Uh, Of course, Christ operated in this power when he literally walked up to a funeral procession and just went up to the widow's son and said, get out of the grave, get out of the coffin. 
That's the power we're talking about. Real, tangible, life-changing power. And here we see uh, the doctrine, really, from Paul in verse 20 of the resurrection. Also, the ascension and the exaltation, because Christ is now raised to above uh, all the heavens into heavenly places, which means he has the highest authority of all. He is exalted to the position of the right hand of the Father. Now, please stay with me here. I don't want to lose you. Christ is not in a chair at the right hand of the throne of God. It's a phrase, figuratively, to say that Christ has been given everything that the Father has. All power from the Father is obviously in the Son, and that Son rules from the right hand of the Father. So in ancient, the ancient world knew this better than us. If you were sitting at the right hand of the king, you had all the king's authority. You were his right-hand man. You did his job for him. And so, yes, there are thrones in heaven. I completely understand that. But I just don't want you to think that Jesus is stuck next to the Father in a chair. These are figurative terms to show us that Christ has all power in heaven. And he, what he says goes. He said in Matthew 28, 18. Again, you can write these down for time's sake. But Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. And I give that to you to go. So what is his is ours. It's the doctrine of union. In Daniel 7.14, And he was given dominion, glory, kingship. The people of every nation, language, should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never, never be destroyed. The focus of Paul here is pointing the Ephesians to one, one of really the most powerful historical events that will ever, not did ever, will ever occur, the raising of the dead of Jesus to show them God can do anything and everything through you if you just realise that he's given you all the power you need to live the Christian life. No reason to backslide. No reason to over, not overcome sin. No reason to live a, not live a God-honouring, Christ-honouring life. Now turn with me to the book of Philippians for a moment. Just go forward a, a book to Philippians chapter 3. And now you'll see this phrase, maybe even in a new light. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, that I may know him. That is not the word I know there. It's a different word, but it is an experiential word a gnosis word, that I may know him, here it is, the dunamis of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. This is exactly the power that he's talking about. Whenever power is used, you'll you notice it quite often in the New Testament that the resurrection is always linked to the power because the resurrection is the greatest picture of the power of God in man. That Paul may know the power of his resurrection. That doesn't mean that Paul... Uh, wants to, you know, in case he dies, he wants to know he can get raised from the dead. No, this is Paul saying that I may know the same power that Christ had, that even to the point of being raised from the dead, I know it's within me. God can do anything through his power that is in me. I have this exceeding greatness of his power in this earthen vessel, this treasure, this power. It's greater than any that a demon or Satan can throw. God's great power within me. That he may know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. So the Spirit's work is to work within us new life. Resurrection is the context there. To die daily and to suffer to be sanctified through suffering in this present life. The Spirit keeps you in all of that. Interestingly, everyone, and this is a whole other study in itself, but if you go back and study the ingredients in the anointing oil in the book of Exodus, I believe it's around chapter 30, 28, 30, the primary ingredient in the anointing was myrrh. Myrrh. And myrrh is a painkiller. The Spirit of God gives you the ability to endure, to long-suffer, to 
you know, be courageous when it gets tough. All right? And I think we're going to need that in the future. Got a lot of, you know, we're a bit like Peter, aren't we, at the moment? Oh, it's okay here. Yeah. It's okay. We're, we're sort of tossed in the breeze and we really need to, to firm up a bit. You know, we're not on a cruise ship, we're on a battleship and just getting that wartime mentality back into view. Okay, so what does resurrection power look like? Well, I've got some examples here of what it, what it really could look like as far as uh, being raised from the deadness of your sins, obeying the call of God, uh, even following through in baptism, uh, that public witness of sort of being dead to yourself and raised to new life, uh, overcoming sin, exemplifying and continu- uh, continued death to your old life, growing in the graces of Christ and, of course, being conformed to Christ is growing in those graces. His love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, uh, long-suffering, uh, faith, meekness uh, uh, and self-control. All of these graces of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Now, I guess at this point we need to ask the question, Paul is saying that the same power uh, that's in you is the power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So I guess we need to ask the question here, is Paul saying that I have all the power that Christ had? Is Paul saying that? Everything that Christ had, I have. Is he, is he saying that? And I just haven't maybe tapped into that. So that's the question I'm asking and then I'm going to answer it very specifically because I th- think we need to be careful here. Uh, just We're assuming we're um, just like Jesus when we are just like Jesus but not exactly like Jesus. <laughs> All right? So we're going to be careful here. You are not Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. And so we've got to be very careful on this, although we are told that what Jesus had We had the same Holy Spirit. So let's get started. Now, do we have all the power that Jesus Christ had? The answer is yes and no. Well, now you're being fancy. Well, I am because I've got to be technical here. So it is, yes, the same Holy Spirit. Amen? It's the same Holy Spirit. Now let's go to Romans 8 together. Romans chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 9 to 11. Romans 8, 9 to 11. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, so there's the presumption the Spirit of God is in you, and if any man has the Spirit of Christ, he does not have the Spirit of Christ, he has none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, if the Spirit of him... Here it is, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Twice. So we're told that the same spirit that dwells in Christ dwells in you. We need to be clear on that. So Christ has the spirit. He's Really, uh, the whole from the beginning of his life in the conception of the womb, the Spirit of God formed Christ in the womb, divinely conceived Christ in the womb, right through to his baptism, where the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, the Spirit came down and dwelt on Christ for ministry in the same way that the Spirit, uh, the same Spirit was in Christ for ministry, he's in us for ministry to serve him. But not in the same way. So we had the same Spirit but not in the same way. And let me explain this now. John 3.34 is very important because John tells us, for he whom God has sent, that is Christ, speaks the words of God and the Father gives the Spirit to him without what? Measure. Where for us, 1 Corinthians 12.7, and we could also turn to Ephesians for this, but now to each one of us, to each one of us in the body of Christ is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So Christ had it without measure. You have the same spirit, but what? With measure. And that measure is measured according to you based on what God has for you to do for him. God doesn't give you more than you need or less than you need. He gives you everything you need. 
You can't say, God, you ripped me off. You haven't given me the power I need. He's given you all you need for life and godliness, including the spiritual power to do what you're required to do. So Christ has it without measure. By the way, that's why he can pray over everyone and every single person gets healed. Every single demon comes out because he has the spirit without measure. Now, if you had the spirit without measure, the same thing would probably happen, but you don't. In God's divine economy, in his providential plan, we have the spirit with measure. Now, it can be argued that if you're faithful with a measure, God may even give you more and he may extend. That's, that's his business. Your job is to be faithful with little and maybe you get more. But in the end, you have it by measure. Christ had it outside of measure. That's why he could have called a legion of angels and they would have attended. And that's not just because he's God, but obviously ministerially, Christ models for us how to live and he needs the Holy Spirit to model that as it's done. So this is why Paul has to remind us that he gives every man, Romans 12, a measure, and not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. All right, We're given a measure of grace and not to get too excited about ourselves. This is also why Spurgeon gives a good reason of that same spirit being within us. He says, why does God put forth as much power towards every Christian as he did in his beloved son? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, brethren, I believe the reason is not only the same power was required, that by this means he gets great glory, but the reason is this, union. It lays in the word union. There must be the same divine power in the member that there is in the head, or else where is the union? If we are one with Christ, members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, there must be a likeness. So you see what Spurgeon's getting at here. We have the same spirit because we're in the same body. The body that Paul will go on in Ephesians and say fills all in all. This is why Paul, in, and maybe we'll have a look at it there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, says that he is the head and we are his body, his church. So Christ fills his church with his spirit. We have the spirit. Now we're told to keep on being filled with the spirit, but we have the Spirit. We are in divine union with Him, and what is His is ours. It's not complicated. What Christ has given us, all spiritual blessings, is ours in Him. It's two parts of the same whole. Christ fills us all as Christians, and we have the Spirit of the living and resurrected Christ within us. I love how um, Puritan Wilhelmus Brackel, finishing with this and then some practical points. Every believer is a member of the Lord Jesus. Same spirit which is in Christ is also in them. And they live by that self-same spirit. Whatever the head experiences, the members also experience. By the way, just pause on this. This is why Paul can suffer and say, I fill up the sufferings of the body of Christ in myself. Now, friends, bear this in mind, and I'm pausing on this quote, but the world hates Christ. They can't get to Christ, but they are going to try and get to Christ through persecuting the church. Now, it might not be as an enthusiastic amen when it happens, but I can tell you, that's how it works. That's New Testament Christianity. Paul fills up the sufferings of the body of Christ in himself. That's why we need to be prepared. This is why you need power. If there's no suffering, if there's no dying to self every day, if it's just, let's just wait until Jesus comes back, why, why do you really need that much power? Why do you need the exceeding greatness of his power that works mightily in you? Because you've got some mighty big things that we're going to have to overcome together as Christians. Some of us can't even overcome a, a petty personal offence. Sorry, I don't mean to make eye contact with people when I say that. 
I, I, I certainly don't want to do that because I think we've all had to overcome personal offences, amen, or we wouldn't be here. Uh, but, you know, seriously, Paul's making this, these claims about God's great power because we're going to need that power. And so I go on with my quote. Whatever the head experiences, the members also experience. Since Christ the head has arisen, life-giving power flows into all his members. It's a wonderful way of seeing it, isn't it? Christ is the head, and as everything from your head signals down into the life-giving members, flows down, so too Christ to his body, the true church. He goes on, for as the graft becomes the recipient of sap and life, giving power, it likewise cannot be that, uh, sorry, it cannot uh, but be that all believers receive the life-giving power of Christ. You know, some of these uh, Puritans that are you know, dead and buried, but their books are still around, praise God for that. So I guess I wanted to finish with uh, a little challenge. What does the resurrection power look like in your life? Uh, just some very basic things to, to road test. How's the resurrection power going in your life? And uh, this is from Brackle, so I'm, I'm sort of taking his analogy because I thought it was quite ingenious the way he did it, so I don't claim any credit for it. But he gives five points about Jesus' death and resurrection that we can model our lives on. And so I'm going to read them for you. Number one, Christ arose in the morning. Brackle says, Let every occurrence of waking up and arising out of the bed stir you up to look to him and how you will faithfully serve him in that day easy to apply these practical points. So let's do that. Number, number two, Christ arose on the first day of the week. Brackle points us to honouring the Lord's day. The first day of the week, the day that Christ rose from the dead. We honour that by obviously living holy lives, which we should live every day of the week, but we do that as a point, particularly on the Lord's Day, because we are gathered together with other believers to exemplify to them this uh, idea that uh, we are Christians who love the Lord and we're willing to make those sacrifices to be in the house of God together. Now, obviously, gathering takes some effort because you need to be organized you know you need to get an early night saturday night you need to be here early for prayer at 9 30 if you can ever make it when we pray together in the four you need to be here ready to go to sing and pray at 10 o'clock on the dot and generally that should be the rule for your life and family to gather on the lord's day and i would say that gathering is so important because it's a picture of the gathered church the ecclesia it's a gospel witness to the world but watch this and this isn't often talked about, but the gathering of the saints, I believe, also pictures our hope of our calling when we will be all what? Gathered to Christ together one final time to be with him forever. So why is gathering so important? I think I made it clear. I think Brackles made it clear. Number three, Christ departed from the grave at resurrection, the place of the dead. You likewise must avoid familiar interaction with worldly, ungodly men. They are dead, he says. They stink and their stench is contagious. So live away from the world. Now we're in the world, but we just don't want to be of the world. He goes on, number four, Christ left his burial garment behind in the grave. The picture is clear. You also ought to hate the garment, spotted or polluted by the flesh. Leave behind Sodom, Egypt, Everything in the grave, it's your old life. Depart from honour, goods, entertainment. Whatever belongs to the world, separate yourself from it. Come out from among them that you may prove yourself in Christ. And then lastly, Christ appeared alive for 40 days. Let your light so shine before men. Put a distance between you and sinners. Show your actions by what you denounce. Manifest your love, humility, uh, heavenly-minded life. To all believers, live a God-honoring, Christ-honoring life by the power that God has given you in him. Amen? Well, gospel challenge. Maybe there are some here who we're talking about the power that God's given us in Christ, but you're not in Christ. You're not a Christian yet. Maybe you haven't confessed a hope in Christ. You're still trying to live by your own power. The Bible says that you are, unlike the Christian who has a hope of their calling, 
The Bible says that you are without hope in this world. Have you not heard this morning that Christ was resurrected? Make no mistake, everyone in this room will be resurrected to a judgment. Some to life, some to eternal death. And at that point, on that day of judgment, the righteous judge will determine if you are able to enter the gates of heaven, what justification will you give that you are worthy of heaven? You must be sinless. You must be perfect. You can only enter heaven through the perfect, sinless, substitutionary Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you would call on him today to save you, that God would give you the grace to repent, turn from your sins and come follow him. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for our calling in Christ, our inheritance in Christ, and for the mighty power of the Holy Spirit that is within us. May we truly know that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. May we wholly and entirely depend on you, Holy Spirit, to aid, help and give us strength to live a Christ-honouring life in this world. May we not fear the devil and his schemes, but rather fight the good fight of faith, knowing that Christ is Lord over all and has all authority and all power in heavenly places. Please keep us now and always in these truths we pray. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the benediction.